Baron takes the lifeless shrouded body of his little brother and makes his way home. Upon reaching the White's estate, the servants greet him with smiles. But Baron sternly orders them to call his father at once. Baron's father flies into a state of fury upon learning about Lucas's death. He goes on a ramble about how despite providing Lucas with the best resources, he still managed to bring shame upon the family. When his wrath overwhelms him, he makes his way to take a swing at Baron who instantly catches his father's wrist. Baron curtly reminds him that he's a lance to which his father responds by telling him that he's only a lance because of the wife's name attached to him. Upon further inquiry into the events that took place in Cyrus, Lord Wykes summons a woman named Adeline. He asks her to draft a message to the council, explaining how Lucas was forced to follow Drenev's plan and in face of threats, Lucas had no choice but to be Drainee's pawn. Sir Wykes cunningly asks Adeline to add that a commoner like Arthur, who was never fit for the reputable society of Cyrus, should be executed for his crimes against the Wykes family. After Adeline takes her leave, Baron asks his father about Lucas's funeral. However, Sir Wykes callously brushes off Baron's question by telling him that he doesn't care. He then asks Baron to leave. Flying over the beast glades, Arthur asks Lance Olfred if the handcuffs were necessary. Olfred answers him by telling him how the mana beasts below them still remain a mystery to them and that it's a mandatory precaution to handcuff the prisoners. The two talk as they glide to their destination. Soon, Olfred's mana glider eventually comes to a halt as Olfred welcomes Arthur to the council's floating castle. Lance Veray informs Arthur that magic doesn't work around the premise and therefore they'll be using the stairs. After their quick ascend, Arthur finds himself inside a grand hall. Olford advises him that it's best not to converse with any of the lances present. As Arthur takes in the castle walls, he notices how the castle is similar to castles from his past life. Finally, Arthur is presented in front of the gladers, Grayzunders and the Aerolith family. King Dossid immediately scolds Arthur after taking note of his lack of manners. Arthur bows an apology and tells the king that he doesn't have the appropriate education required to greet royalty. After removing Arthur's handcuffs, King Dossid announces that Arthur should be mutilated and crippled for the atrocities done against Lucas. Alduin, on the other hand, objects and says that if it wasn't for Arthur, their kids wouldn't have lived to see another day. An immediate fight breaks out between Dossid and Alduin. Dossid angrily states that Arthur can't be trusted, while Alduin labels Dossid as a paranoid man. Dossid reminds Alduin that he has only one lance, and therefore should not consider himself equal to him. As Arthur watches the two kings go back and forth with disinterest, he tries to speak for himself, but is immediately told to remain silent by Dossid. Arthur ignores Dossid and says that if they're not going to listen to his side, then there is no need for him to be there. Glaudera agrees with Arthur and orders Ulfred to lock Arthur in the dungeon until further notice. As Arthur is taken in custody once again, he reflects on the meeting with his majesties. He realizes that the dwarf king is against him and the gladers refuse to give their input in the matter. Once he's confined to his dungeon, Arthur wonders if he can rely on Alduin and Muriel for help. While left alone in the dungeon, Arthur hears the familiar voice of Director Goodsky. Arthur comes to learn from Director Goodsky that she has been imprisoned by the council after her meeting with them. When Arthur realizes that Director Goodsky has no idea of what went down in her own academy, he tells her about how Lucas was pumped on the drug that has been making rounds in the academy. However, unlike the rest of the victims, Lucas appeared sane and powerful. After listening to Arthur, Director Goodsky cryptically hints that she knows the person behind the whole situation. Arthur asks her to clarify what she means, but she tells Arthur that she's no longer the director and that the council will be using her as a scapegoat for the incident. Director Goodsky bows her head in defeat and says that even though she wishes to help him and tell him more, she can't because of the curse the council had placed on her. Elsewhere in the castle, 
Dawson angrily barges into Blaine's chambers. He goes on to yell at him, exclaiming that they had an agreement. Blaine gulps down the glass of wine in his hand and says to Dawson that he has their vote, but he will absolutely not support him in his illogical claims against Arthur. Dawson faces Blaine and says that if they want a future on their continent, they must take care of Arthur and Sylvie. Blaine tells him that he doesn't need him to reiterate their agreement. He then feebly comments on how they're betraying their people. Dawson dismisses Blaine and says that once he, referring to Averona, arrives, they'll be in good hands. After hearing Dawson, he warns him not to put him on the same pedestal as him since he's forced to submit to him because of his family. Once Dawson exits the room, Blaine reflects on his own life and wonders if he made the decision for the betterment of his people or if it was simply because of his sinful and corrupt desires. He quickly assures himself that everything he did was for the greater good as he falls into a drunken slumber. Arthur wakes up to dark, cloudy skies as he notices a castle by him, surrounded by a group of crows. As he watches the crows, he notices their fixation and realizes that they are surrounding something. He tries to find out what the crows are so interested in and climbs up the side of the castle. When he reaches the top of the castle, the feeling of terror and distress plagues his body as he sees severed heads placed on top of spikes. As he reaches out his hand to take a closer look, the severed heads suddenly turn, revealing themselves to be the heads of his loved ones. Arthur screams in fear as he lets go of the castle ledge and falls to his demise. Before he can hit the ground, Arthur wakes up from his nightmare shaken and trembling as he looks down at his hands. Suddenly, Arthur is greeted by Alduin's lance, Aya, as she tells him not to speak, and hands him a letter. Arthur opens the letter by Alduin, who informs him that the incident that took place in the Academy is much more serious than it looks. He tells Arthur that the Council is planning on declaring him and Director Goodsky as the orchestrators of the attack. Alduin further states that after eavesdropping on Blaine and Dossid's conversation, he has found out that the Council is preparing to deliver him alive to someone. Alduin reveals that as a symbol of gratitude for saving Tessia time and time again, he has asked his father to give his parents a safe harbor and look after them while Arthur is imprisoned. As the letter magically vaporizes, Baron arrives to come and take Arthur to his trial. As Baron escorts Arthur, he maliciously tells him that he'll make sure to subject his family to the same torment he put Lucas through. Arthur ridicules Baron for trying to pick a fight with a 13-year-old and tells him that it was his brother's fault for joining hands with evil. As Baron shoves him to the ground, Arthur hears that Director Goodsky has been sentenced to death and will have a public execution. In front of the council, Arthur is told that he'll be stripped of his title as a mage and all the benefits that follow the title. Furthermore, he'll be imprisoned until the grieving families have had their closure. Arthur asks the council about Sylvie and Dossid smirks, replying that she'll be in good hands as they value the power she possesses. After the verdict, Arthur is taken back to his cell by Baron. In the darkness, Arthur jokes about his current situation, stating that it's not so bad. He asks Winsome what took him so long as he steps out from the shadows with Sylvie nuzzled in his arms. In the dwarf royalty chambers, Dossid snuggles up with his wife as they delightfully envision their bright future together. Dostad raises his glass and says how he and his people have been chosen to lead the continent with Agrona. Glaudera asks her husband about Agrona's power and Dostad discloses that he has had his fair share of run-ins with death. However, nothing has made him as fearful as Agrona has. He tells Glaudera that it truly felt like he was facing a god. Glaudera affectionately caresses Dostad's face and says to him how his subjects admire him. Dossid replies to her that it's all because of the lances in his possession. Things get heated in the moment of happiness between Glaudera and Dossid, when suddenly the door to their room is flung open. A mysterious man emitting great power greets the Graysunders with a knight's lifeless body. Dossid immediately yells at the man and asks him if he knows of the title and position he holds. The man replies that he has been sent to execute them. Suddenly, Ulfred appears in the room to face the man. A fight ensues between the two, but it only lasts a second as the man easily defeats Ulfred. He compliments his skills and says that his powers will come in handy later on. 
After taking care of Olford, the man is attacked by Micah. Despite Micah's impressive gravity manipulation magic, Dossid realizes that the man sent as an angel of death wields too much power. He quickly bows in front of him while Glaudir angrily confronts the man saying that Dossid will soon become Agrona's right-hand man. Dossid immediately takes a hold of Glaudir's head and tells her to bow. Dossid pleads for his life. The man, in response, tells him to free the lances in his possession. Dossid immediately complies with his demand and frees the lances. Once the deed had been done, Dossid asks the man to let him and his wife live. But the man informs Dossid that he never agreed to let them live as he effortlessly kills both Dossid and his wife. In the prison cell, Arthur pets Sylvie as he takes her into his protective arms. He thanks Winsome who reminds him that although his actions were noble, he can't put his and Sylvie's life in jeopardy. To which Arthur replies that he was just trying to protect the people dear to him. Winsome then says that he doesn't understand why Agrona's allies would take Alaja. Arthur immediately replies to him that he must get out and save his friend. But Winsome cuts off Arthur and says that trying to save his friend is a death mission as Draneve has taken him to Alacria. Arthur sits back in defeat as Winsome continues by telling him that if Agrona gets a whiff of Sylvie, then even the Azuras may not be able to protect them. In frustration, Arthur asks Winsome about what he should do, when suddenly Baron enters the cell. He roars upon seeing Winsome and inquires if he's with the other intruders. Winsome gives him a short yes which sends Baron into a fit of rage. He directs an attack toward Winsome who deflects his attempt without breaking a sweat. Foray comes and stops Baron from making more futile attempts. She tells him that the man standing before him is a deity. After paying her respects, she informs Winsome that the king has requested his presence. Arthur and Winsome face the Gladers, Irolith, and the man who slay the Greysunders. He reveals that he's known as Alder. Alder explains that he and Winsome have been sent to prepare them for the imminent war with Agrama. In a timid voice, Blaine asks Alder why he requires their help when the Asturas are way more powerful than them. Alder tells Blaine that there is a treaty between the Asora and Vritra clans that prevents him from directly helping them. Winsome steps in and tells Arthur that they'll be going to his family to say his goodbyes, as he'll be going to Ephius, the homeland of the Azuras, for his training. Arthur and Winsome walk through the forest to make their way to Elder Rinia's place. Winsome asks Arthur if he paid any attention to what he was saying regarding Ephiotis and the High Eight. Arthur affirms to him that he knows that there are eight races of Asora and Ephiotis. Each race comprises of multiple clans, but only one clan of each race is considered as one of the High Eight. Arthur expresses his disbelief after learning that the clans tried to assassinate Agrona. Winsome explains to Arthur that Agrona is such a dangerous threat that at first, they believe that eliminating him was the best course of action. As the two reach their location, Arthur tells Winsome that he doesn't understand how Sylvia fits into all this. Winsome discloses that Sylvia ventured with the elite division to take down Agrona. However, Agrona had been waiting for their arrival with a basilisk's army and a few lesser races, who had the same magical abilities as Asuras, revealing that the Vritra clan had been interbreeding and experimenting with the lesser races on Alacria. As anyone would expect, everyone from the Fiotis was either killed or captured. Agrona personally appeared in front of Lord Indrath and delivered the news of Sylvia's death. Lord Indrath was overcome with rage and wanted vengeance, but the other clans pushed for a much more peaceful resort, thus creating the tree. After digesting Winsome's words, Arthur asks him if he's just a pawn for the Usor clan. Winsome tells him to just look at him trying to protect his friends and family. He then asks Arthur if he's ready to break the news to his parents. He nods and enters Elder Rinia's cave. Arthur is immediately taken in a warm embrace by his family.
When Winsome makes his grand entrance, Arthur's family freezes in surprise. Arthur introduces Winsome to his family by telling them that Winsome is his future teacher. After enjoying a meal together, Arthur excuses himself and his parents. He sits his mother and father down and reveals how he was transported to this world. Alice takes Arthur's face in her tender hands and asks him where this is all coming from and if his teacher told him to say all of this. Arthur tries to explain to his parents how his birth is a form of reincarnation. Alice grows apprehensive as her son blurts out foreign words. Reynolds tells Alice to calmly listen to Arthur's story. Arthur does his best to disclose his previous life to his parents. Throughout his tale, he notes how his father remained expressionless while his mother trembled with every new detail uttered by him. After what seemed like several hours, Alice bursts into laughter. She says that she knows this is all but an elaborate joke by him as she slumps back in disbelief. As his father consoles his mother, Arthur takes it as his cue to leave. After a while, his father eventually comes out of the house and tells Ellie to stay with her mother while he's gone. Ellie does as she is told, but before she leaves, she hugs Arthur and tells him to promise that he'll always come back to them. Arthur and his father go for a stroll together to discuss the recent news Arthur had relayed to them. As they are walking, Arthur asks Reynolds, his father, if he believes him. Without looking directly at Arthur, he says that it all makes sense. Arthur asks him if he's okay and Reynolds aggressively replies that of course he's not okay. He asks Arthur if all the memories they have as a family were just a facade, and if he just acted the way they believed that their son would have acted. Reynolds grows angrier and says that his wife technically nursed a middle-aged man. In his rage and confusion, Reynolds angrily punches the cave wall. Understanding his father's feelings, Arthur tells him that he just wanted to tell them the truth before he left. As Arthur turns away from Reynolds, he reveals how he never had a family in his past life. But in this life, growing in a loving environment has made him a better person. Tears begin to stream down his face as Arthur thanks Reynolds for loving him as a son and leaves Reynolds alone to shed tears of his own. Arthur makes his return to the cave and Elder Rinia asks Arthur if he'll be saying his goodbyes to his family. Arthur blankly tells her that he has taken care of everything. Rinia grows concerned by looking at his expression and advises Arthur to never forget the kindness inside him. She then tells him to go as she'll take care of the rest. As Winsome creates a portal out of his blood, Arthur asks him if there was something wrong with his expression. Winsome states that he had the same expression as the Pantheon Ajuras, a race of warriors that have mastered the ability to close off their emotions in order to fight with efficiency. Winsome asks Arthur if he's ready, and Arthur firmly tells him that he's all set. Reynolds curses himself for the way he acted with Arthur. He admits to himself that he had always known that Arthur was different from the rest. It was his pride that blinded him as he desperately wanted to believe that he had raised a genius. Reynolds sits beside Elder Rinia who tells him that she had always been afraid of the day when Arthur would reveal the truth to him. Surprised by Elder Rinia's words, Reynolds asks if she had always known the truth. Elder Rinia tells him that she sees many things, but Arthur is a special case. However, what she does know is that Arthur has come a long way as a person since her first encounter with him as a toddler. She profoundly says to Reynolds that Arthur probably took this huge risk in order to fully break out of the cold shell he once found safety and comfort in. Elder Rinia then hands him a bundled up ball and tells him that Winsome gave it to her as a gift for the Lewin family. When Reynolds takes a look, he finds a bear cub staring at him. Ellie sneaks up from behind and gushes over the cub's cuteness. While looking at him, the two form a bond with each other. Ellie happily chimes that she'll name the cub Boo. Reynolds makes his way to see his wife. Upon Reynolds' arrival, Alice asks him if Arthur is gone and he answers yes. Reynolds gently takes his wife's head and comforts her when she calls herself a horrible person. As tears roll down her cheeks, Alice asks if she's a horrible mother for doubting whether or not Arthur is her son. Reynolds hesitates to answer Alice as he thinks of the sacrifices, 
Alice had to make in order to raise Arthur, and how now everything seems like a lie. Reynolds shrugs off his thoughts and toughens up for Alice. He admits to Alice that it is hard for him to call Arthur a son, but hopefully that'll change once they see him again. One thing that'll remain constant is that Arthur will always be a part of the Lingwin family. Alice wipes off her tears and shares a sweet, comforting smile with her husband. Meanwhile, Winsome and Arthur arrive in the Fiotis. Winsome welcomes him to the Indrath clan's castle. Arthur's eyes take in the magnificent palace laid out in front of him. He nervously asks Winsome if he has any tips for him before he presents himself to the Lord of Lords. Winsome confesses that he's as clueless as him, since it's an odd situation for him too. Two gatekeepers appear to greet Winsome, and they open the gate to the royal courtroom. Arthur sets his eyes on Lord Indrath and realizes that he can't sense his aura. Immediately, he falls to his knees in pain. When he glances up, he sees that Indrath had brought the sleeping Sylvie to himself. Once Arthur regains his composure, Indrath dully notes how he has done nothing to train his granddaughter. Arthur grits his teeth upon hearing Indrath's remarks. Winsome apologizes and says that he'll begin Sylvie's training at once, but Indrath tells Winsome that he'll personally supervise Sylvie's training. After a prolonged period of silence, Arthur asks Indrath why he was brought to the Land of Deities. Indrath states that he simply deemed him a necessary piece in the war against Agrona and his growing army. He continues by adding that along with Winsome, several specialists will oversee his training. Arthur then asks Indrath what will become of Sylvie, and Indrath replies that Sylvie will be staying with him. Winsome quickly drags Arthur outside before he can protest further. Arthur sulks and says to Winsome that he did not understand the purpose of his meeting with Indrath, and what's worse was that Sylvie was taken away from him. Winsome reminds him that he's a lesser being and that taking his help is a wound to the Azura's pride. However, he assures Arthur that both he and his bond will be taken care of. After coming to a halt, Winsome announces that they've reached their destination. Winsome suddenly grabs a hold of Arthur and throws him through an invisible force field leading him into a cave. When inside, Winsome introduces Arthur to his friend, Cordry. He reveals that Cordry belongs to the Thias clan of the Pantheon Usor race, just like Alder. Cordry asks Winsome if Lord Indrath had given him the Aether Orb. Winsome shows him the orb, to which Arthur curiously asks about. Cordry gives him a detailed explanation about the orb that flies over Arthur's head. Winsome simplifies the explanation and tells Arthur that the pond filled with ether liquid will accelerate his training and will heal any and all wounds that he will receive during his training. As Arthur finds himself encircled by the water tides, he asks Winsome what's going on. Winsome smirks and says that he'll know soon enough as the tides overwhelm him.